Introduction to Kubernetes. We are going to learn about containers, Docker, container orchestration, Kubernetes and Kubernetes services. Why do we need containers? Have you ever faced a situation where your application runs fine in one environment but not when deployed in another environment? To solve this problem, we use containers. A container is a unit of software that packages code and its dependencies that can be run reliably across computing environments. It provides highly portable workloads. What is Docker? Docker is a platform that allows you to package and run containers. And a Docker image is a read-only template that includes information about the containerized application. Container Registry is a repository for container images. Docker Hub and Amazon ECR are examples of container registries. Containers are downloaded from container registries and run on host machines using a container runtime engine like Docker. On the surface, containers look like virtual machines, but there are important differences. A virtual machine is made up of a physical infrastructure with an hypervisor and guest operating systems that make up the virtual machine. Your application along with dependency files runs on this guest operating system. While in the case of containers, on top of the physical infrastructure and operating system, we have a container engine like Docker, which runs our containers in isolated environments. Container application and its dependency files are packaged as container images, which are highly portable. Here is an example of two containers running on a host a Node.js web server and a MongoDB database. Although they are on the same host, they are suitably isolated from one another by the container engine. So containers provide you isolation, portability, version control, consistency, multi-cloud support and scalability. Here's a typical container development to deployment workflow. Once a developer is done creating his application, he writes a Docker file, which contains information about his application code and dependencies. Then he runs a Docker build command to create a container image. The container image contains all the application code and dependencies. This image is uploaded to a container registry. When you need to run this container, you download it from the container registry onto a host machine and run it. What happens when you have many containers to run and manage? You need an orchestrator that can schedule, manage and run containers on various hosts in a cluster. Therefore, container orchestration is automation of deployment, management, scaling and networking of containers. An orchestrator would typically work with many computing nodes in a cluster on which containers are deployed and run. It tracks resources on these nodes and lifecycle of containers. Some popular container orchestration tools are Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, Mesos, and Nomad. Of these, Kubernetes is immensely popular. So let's learn more about Kubernetes. Here's a Kubernetes cluster architecture at a high level. There is a Kubernetes control plane and nodes. The control plane has several processes which manages the cluster. On nodes, you have containers running in pods. The control plane is made up of API server, controller manager, cloud controller manager, scheduler, etc. API server exposes APIs to manage the Kubernetes cluster. On nodes, you have kubelet and kube proxy which interact with the API server to manage the pods on nodes. In addition, there are Kubernetes services that provide access to pods over a network. In order to manage a Kubernetes cluster, you could use a tool called kubectl. This is a Kubernetes specific command line tool that lets you communicate with and control Kubernetes clusters.
it interacts with the API server on Kubernetes control plane by making API calls to it when you issue kubectl commands. What are Kubernetes pods? It is the smallest unit of deployment in Kubernetes. It is an abstraction on top of a container and therefore a virtual host for a container. They are ephemeral, they can die and be replaced. A pod has a unique IP address and if it is replaced, its IP address changes. A pod can have multiple containers. For example, it might have a helper or a side container alongside the main container. Kubernetes deployment is a declarative definition of how pods should be deployed. It is defined as a YAML file. It contains information about how many replicas of a pod should exist at a time, the labels for a pod, and what containers it should run. Here's a diagrammatic representation of how you can think of deployment. In Kubernetes, a service is an entity that represents a set of pods. It is assigned a virtual IP address which persists even if pods it represents are destroyed or recreated. Here's how you would define a service in a YAML file. Note the selector part. So any pod in the cluster that has a label app colon web server would become a target for the service. There are three main types of Kubernetes services, cluster IP, node port and load balancer. Let's look at each of them one by one. Here's an example of cluster IP service. This is the default service type and it is only accessible within the cluster. Here it sends traffic to pods which match the selector label app colon web server. It receives traffic on port 80 and sends traffic to port 8080 on pods. And here's a diagrammatic representation of the cluster IP service. As you can see, the pods for the service are identified based on selector labels. Here's an example of node port service. A node port service makes node IP addresses directly accessible from outside the cluster. A node port can be between 30,000 to 32,767. Pods with labels that match the service selector receive traffic irrespective of what nodes they are on. Node IP addresses are accessible from outside the cluster on port 32,000. Selected pods receive traffic on target port 8080. Now, accessing node IP addresses directly from outside the cluster is not a very good idea because nodes may be replaced and their IP addresses could change. So let's see how a load balancer service will be useful here. Here's an example of load balancer service. It is accessible from outside the cluster. It creates a cloud load balancer and is based on node port service. It forwards traffic to pods based on selector. So when you create a load balancer service in Kubernetes, it results in creation of a cloud load balancer, which points to a node port service and pods that match the service selector criteria receive traffic. Since the cloud load balancer IP address is fixed, you do not have to worry about node IP addresses within the cluster changing. Here's an example of a Kubernetes cluster with multiple services. Here the load balancer service sends requests to pods running Nginx web server. It selects these pods based on selector app web server. Now when Nginx web server needs to connect to MongoDB instances running in pods, it makes use of cluster IP service. The cluster IP service provides a static IP address and forwards traffic to MongoDB pods based on selector app colon database. Since the pods are ephemeral and can be replaced, these services provide a static IP address to reach the underlying pods. Kubernetes Ingress is an API object that manages external access to services in a cluster 
via HTTP or HTTPS. Here the traffic routing is done based on pre-configured rules and it requires an ingress controller to function. It can provide load balancing, SSL termination and name-based virtual hosting. Here is an example ingress YAML file which has a rule based on paths. So all HTTP requests with a slash foo path are sent to service 1 and those with slash bar path are sent to service 2. Therefore, it can integrate directly with services based on path or subdomain. Here's a diagrammatic representation of how this works. Remember that Ingress works on OSI layer 7, that is the application layer. Before we close, here are some questions for you. What is the smallest unit of deployment in Kubernetes? What is the purpose of a selector in a service?